Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Alan Akash. I worked at Unix Supercomputing Center for about 10 years now, actually. And I mostly worked in one of the EU HPC centers of excellence. But I did have, well, I was the one who brought EasyBuild to ULIC, and I also was responsible for the big machines there when it was initially installed for four or five years ago. And now EasyBuild is used across all the all the resources in ULIC. So ULIC itself, it's a it's a pretty large supercomputing center, and it's around since about 1987. It has when I started, there was just over 100 people working at ULIC, but it's doubled in size in the last 10 years. So we now have about 200 people who do everything across the, the range of activities in supercomputing and simulation sciences. And that includes these days quantum computing as well and lots of stuff for the AI and things like that as well. Um, we have at the moment three primary systems. Uh, so our big system is called Jules. It's based on this uh, concept of modular supercomputing architectures so that you have uh, different parts of the systems with potentially different architectures and different capabilities. And the system at the moment is, I think it's 12 petaflops, and that'll be increased this year to 70 petaflops because we're about to get, to get a, uh, an Ampere, uh, an NVIDIA Ampere GPU booster partition, which is about 58 petaflops, and that's due to be delivered before the end of this year. So we'd be the first, I think, in the official announcement, we're the first supercomputing center to get get a, the Ampere GPU, so especially at that size. That should make us the, that, that should make Jules the biggest super com, public supercomputer in Europe then. Um, the next, one of the other systems that we have is, which is the one I was originally involved with setting up with EasyBuild, that's Eureka. So that's also a modular supercomputing architecture. So it has G, CPU partitions, it has GPU partition, and it also has Knight's nice Landing as well. So it has a, the largest part of the flops comes from the, the, the Knight's nice Landing partition as well. And um, that's actually due to be replaced this year as well. So there's a lot of activity in terms of hardware going on in Unix this year. And um, so largely dismantled and replaced them um, with a kind of a, a lot of data centric um, uh, hardware. Uh, the final thing is something called uh, Yusuf. It's uh, an AMD machine with uh, quite a few V100 NVIDIA GPUs as well. Um, this machine is targeted towards particular workloads, so interactive workflow, and then a lot of community-based web services that require um, HPC resources as well. That's that's the main target for that system. In terms of how we use EasyBuild at JSC, well, we've been using it for a while, and so I think the, I think Kenneth mentioned that like the first public release was in 2012. And we were already coordinating a workshop on EasyBuild by, I think it was in early, early 2013. And um, the way we use it on our system is, of course, we have a lot of different users. We have a lot of different systems uh, and the users have a lot of different capabilities. So the general usage is targets towards the, the average user experience. And um, so what that means for us is that we hide a lot of indirect software, software that, that, that a user typically might want, not necessarily want and want in a, in a normal workflow. So they might be interested in Gromax, but not all of the dependencies of Gromax. So, so we might hide a, hide a lot of, um, of these indirect dependencies that people might have. Um, we also have a lot of tool chains because we have these different kinds of hardware on the same machine um, that tends to require um, different compilers. So for example, if you want to use OpenACC on our Eureka machine, then you're probably going to need the, the Portland Group compiler and um, we also have different MPIs and um, because you want to, you want to make you sure that your CUDA aware MPI is available for the, the CUDA partitions, but also we also have custom MPIs that are, are, are geared towards our the CPU partition of the machine as well. So in general, this leads like to proliferation of tool chains. And because we have lots of tool chains, then a module hierarchy makes a lot of sense for us. And um, so that we make sure that what people get is, is actually compatible. And when they when they try and run their, their code. And we also rename some modules to try and make it easier for people as well. So, so for example, as an example, instead of calling the Intel MPI implementation, the, the, the software name is IMPI, but we re rename it to Intel MPI. In EasyBuild, the Intel compilers are called ECCI Fort. And we rename those to just call them Intel. And, 
and there's a couple of other cases like that, but they're not so many. But the idea is just to make it some names. We just tweak them a little bit to, to try and make it easier for our users. We also do a couple of LMOD tweaks as well, um, just adding some tags to different modules and also changing the way LMOD looks a little bit to the end user as well, just try and make everything uh, as straightforward as possible. Um, we have lots of custom customizations. We've been using EasyBuild since 2012, and it's kind of a little bit as a result of that. So we use our, our, our own custom module naming scheme, which is very heavily related to the module hierarchy, but, but has some slight customizations on top of that. Um, we have lots of custom tool chains that we use because we have our own combinations of, of various things. Um, we maintain our own easy, easy config stack. Um, and that's because our update cycle is not exactly in sync with EasyBuild and our tool chains are not exactly the same as the ones that are used in the, the distributed um, easy configs uh, of EasyBuild. So we have until now maintained our own set, set of easy configs. Um, and we also have custom easy blocks. So we don't have too many of those, but we do have some for, for things we do ourselves. Um, in terms of the impact of this, I think really it, it becomes a little bit of a maintenance thing. So it means that we actually have to carry out quite a bit of maintenance. And it also inhibits our ability to contribute back. So if we're using custom easy blocks and or custom easy and configs and custom tool chains, it makes it a bit convoluted for us to contribute back to the main repos, especially because our update, update cycle is slightly out. So in terms of things like our dependencies, they might not be, the versions might not be exactly the same as the main repo. So that, that makes things hard. Um, and we're working pretty hard to try and remove this at the moment, right? So as much as possible, we actually want to align ourselves with EasyBuild and just use customizations in other ways. Um, in terms of how we present software to the users, um, so we get new users twice a year. And when new users come on our machine, we only want them to see the latest versions of the software. So we actually have what's called a stages concept. Um, so whenever new people come on the machine, they see um, a stage, which is the latest versions of our tool chains with the latest versions of the software available in those tool chains. And this gets updated twice a year. So the production view that people see gets updated twice a year. Um, the idea behind this is that it encourages people to adopt the latest software and all the dependencies, and that should lead to hopefully better performance and people not running into bugs that, are, that were there in previous versions. Of course, um, we make it possible so that people can, can still use all software, right? So it's, it just becomes, there's a, a, a step involved in them getting access to previously installed software. But by default, we want to push people um, to the latest versions of software um, all the time. And we do that twice a year. Um, so yeah, we give indirect access to the retired software. So there's a step involved that they need to do. And this also has an impact on, on module spider as well. So because of the way we present software, when people, so when somebody does a module spider, they by default will only look in the current stage. Um, but if they do use a, an additional simple module use statement, then they'll actually have access to all of the software, including all the legacy software. And it's, as you can imagine, after, after your user is running for four, four to five years now, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of old software there. So again, the idea of the stages is to keep the view for the average user quite clean and not, not overpower them with lots of different um, software versions and things like that. And um, what we're looking at now, which is like relatively recent in, in EasyBuild, is the, this idea of hooks. So being able to hook into various steps that uh, along the way when EasyBuild is building software. And we want to use that both for our maintainers and, and for our users as well. So we see this as a pretty a powerful alternative to doing the customizations. And this is our way of backing out of, of, of the maintenance problem that we have and trying to just instead create some, some pretty powerful hooks and then use them to, to, to have an, to, well, we see them as much more automated. So, so they, they can be clever, they can have logic inside and that makes them a lot more flexible as well. And for us, then it will be easier to maintain in the future. So for example, one of the reasons we maintain our own easy configs is that we actually want to insert things like um, a side contact. So the person that's responsible for a particular software package. At the moment, that's requiring us to, to maintain our own easy configs, but we could actually do that with a hook. And that would be quite easy to do in a hook. So, so that's one of the reasons we use those. Um, 
The other thing we want to do is that we want to enable user space installations. And that's a little bit tricky and um, because you could say that there's a right way to do this. So for example, you've heard a little bit now about GCC Core. And um, so the tool chain GCC Core usually has a lot of dependencies in there that maybe users are not really don't really care about. But it means that if they want to use their own GCC Core, it's a uh, it, it usually pulls in a lot of uh, additional software dependency for them because it would require something else. So, so a hook is a way to actually tell them, don't do that. Instead of doing that, use um, some of the tricks that some of the stuff that's in there, the tweaks that are available in Easy Build. So instead of using and um, trying to build a new GCC, use instead try toolchain on your thing or, so, or, or and it can also tell you. Um, you can tell people how to resolve dependencies or how to use the soft, the easy configs that are available in the JSC repo. Um, and basically there's lots of little things that you can do to make the user experience uh, a little bit more straightforward and a little bit and a lot more compatible with how we deliver our software. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's it for me. That's all I wanted to say. So maybe somebody has any questions.